Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Terry Ives, and I have the uh, wonderful opportunity to be the 2013 Society President. It's an honor for me to, uh, to introduce uh, some of the people here this morning. Again, I want to welcome you to our Automation Week, which is ISA's premier technology and solutions event. As I mentioned yesterday, it's my hope as you uh, leave the event here over the course of a couple days that you have a renewed dedication to the automation industry, to your profession, and to ISA, where we're trying to set the standard for automation. For those of you that weren't uh, with us yesterday, I'd like to introduce Paul Galeski. Paul is our Automation Week Chair. He's a program chair that's been working tirelessly for the last couple months to pull together the technical content for this program. Paul is the founder and CEO of Maverick Technologies, a leading systems integration firm and ISA strategic partner for systems integration. Paul's been involved with industrial automation for over 25 years, a licensed professional engineer, he holds a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from Southern Illinois University. He's a graduate of GE Executive Management School and the Harvard Business School President's Program. Paul was one of Fast, for fast Forward's 40 Under 40, a listing of the top young executives in the St. Louis area. He's an ISA member, certified automation professional, CAP, an IEEE member. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Paul Gluskin. Thanks, Terry. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome again to Automation Week. I hope you all enjoyed yesterday as much as I did. We had really robust content and a lot of different sessions that were very, very well attended, and I think uh, I certainly walked away with a lot of knowledge yesterday, and I hope you all did too. Uh, we've got another world-class lineup of presenters today, uh, starting with a wonderful keynote here. As I said yesterday, when we went on this mission a year ago, one of our goals was to really increase uh, awareness about cybersecurity in the industrial space. And I think our keynote today is really gonna help us along that way. I'm really encouraged to engage uh, General Wheeler, you'll find this somewhat shy and retiring, so we probably need some questions to really prod him to, uh, to move along. And also, I invite you all to the hub tonight and from 5 to 7 and to meet everyone and say hello. Uh, at this point, I'm really proud to present to you, uh, to in, here to introduce our keynote speaker, he is retired Brigadier, Brigadier General an annoying Red Sox fan, Rudy Paxson. Hey, Paul, go Sox. <laughs> one more, one more. We are very fortunate to have a keynote speaker this morning who is deeply involved in our government's efforts to address the cyber threat to America's critical infrastructure and the automation industry. I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, General Wheeler and his career as a scholar, pilot, commander, and leader. General Wheeler was commissioned through the Reserve Officer Training Corps at the University of Wisconsin, where he also earned a BS in engineering. He subsequent, subsequently graduated from a number of prestigious military schools, including the Naval College of Command and Staff in Newport, Rhode Island, and the NATO Defense College in Rome, Italy. He's been a diplomat as when he served as the senior military advisor to the U.S. mission to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe in Vienna, Austria. He's been a leader. He's commanded two U.S. Air Force bomber wings, the second bomb wing at Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. Think giant B-52s, Lots of them dropping lots of bombs out of them, that's General Wheeler. And the 509th 
also commanded the 509th Bomb Wing at White Wing Air Force Base in Missouri. That's America's only stealth bomb wing. So he has flown and commanded the squadron group and wing level. He's been in charge of all those bombers. Think one billion dollars per copy, and he commanded all of them. By the way, he's got more than 5,000 hours of flying time in those uh, combat proven strategic airplanes. He's done some pretty other tough jobs. His last assignment was as the Deputy Director for Nuclear Operations, the U.S. Strategic Command off of Air Force Base in Nebraska, where he was the principal advisor on issues pertaining to strategic deterrence and nuclear operations. How hard could that be? General Wheeler now serves on the staff of the Secretary of Defense at the Pentagon as the Deputy Chief Information Officer for Command, Control, Communications, and Computers, and Information Infrastructure Capabilities. That's a mouthful even in the Pentagon. That's, uh, so he's doing a hugely critical job keeping America safe, and it needs a mover and shaker such as the shy and retiring General Bob Wheeler. Please join me in welcoming General Wheeler. There's a lot of good stories I can tell you afterwards if you would like at General Pex and he and I have flown together. So there's been a lot of different things that we have done in airplanes that he may not have told you about. I'm happy to bring it up if you'd like to hear about it later. So, so, so the question you may have asked after you just heard my bio is why would I be in the CIO? There's your first question right off the bat. I have an engineer, I have used that for a year, but why am I in that particular area? Bottom line to it is they wanted an operator up there to, to connect to all the different things that are happening up there to put an operational spin on it, because I've been doing operations, I was in command from 2001 all the way almost to 2009 in, in continuous operations all over the world. And they wanted that spin. I can give you some background on myself a little bit that might help you also understand where I came into this. I was a young kid, as a ham raider operator. I used to build all my own stuff. I loved doing that kind of stuff. I was kind of geeky in that particular arena. And then when I got uh, into the B-2s, flying stealth bombers and that, 9-11 uh, came. I was a squadron commander in 9-11 and I watched our nation change overnight. And we had to have an answer to it. And the airplane that we built had gone through the standard DOD acquisition cycle was designed for something, but it wasn't designed for that kind of operation. And we had to move fast. And we had to do it quickly. And we had to use automation overnight. And truly, industry was not ready to deal with it. So we had to do this ourselves. And we physically built our own capabilities into the airplane. While soldering, welding, and building, I still remember soldering my own connections as a squadron commander before we took off less than 30 days after 9 11 and went into Afghanistan, the longest combat stories in history, and still are. I'm 44.7 hours with just two folks in the airplanes and dropping those weapons. But that communication infrastructure that we built was designed overnight, and, and it is actually today part of the standards we actually connected into the aircraft. And how we did it was simply this I flew a T 38 small airplane, picked up some radios in one location, put them in bubble wrap, put them in the underneath the aircraft in that particular area. I had my best guys come together. I got NSA in there to build the encryption keys for me. We connected this all up. I wanted to move fast. I didn't want to buy expensive laptops, so I took Dell laptops right off the shelf. I connected them in. I put it between my ejection seat, and I built Microsoft uh, email, because you have to understand, the United States Air Force, we cannot do an email PowerPoint, so we have got to have it in. <laughs> so I have that in between there. And as my missions got changed, they come out as an email. You have it. Boom. And I'd be flying because halfway there things change. And I would take the data, I would drop it down to the actual uh, desktop, and it would go into keys, into my PCMCI card, and I'd populate the jet as I went into the target area. I had a little printer connected to my thing, and I'd print on my leg, and I'm all in an ejection seat while I'm doing this, okay? And that's the kind of innovation and the kind of speed at which we had to go. And so that's, this, that's what made me get involved in this more and more. And we ended up calling it, and we do in the CIO today, and that's how we do governance, is geeks and ops. So we really try to meld those two together. Because as I'm going to talk to you in a minute, you can't burn IA in later on. You can't bolt it on. That information, assurance, that security has to be burned in from the beginning. You can't sequester those folks off in some other little section and not bring them in 
on day one to be part of the basic engineering, or you'll end up getting yourself in trouble, or it'll be it'll cause all sorts of problems for people to actually use the particular tool you're trying to do, and we'll get around it. I guarantee it. So we try to build that in early on, and we try to what we call in the governance cycle with the Pentagon geeks, geeks and ops. When I sit there, I'm on one side is the operator with, with, with that background in there, and I sit right next to folks that have done nothing but information assurance and cybersecurity their whole lives, and together we try to blend the best methodologies of going forward. And we have to do that right now because it's not something that we can worry about tomorrow. It's something we have to worry about today. And as I was talking before, government's always not good at doing problems that are out 10 years, that are out five years, they're just not, because it's not a threat in their face today. And we're waiting, we have, at least DOD side has woken up, and I think the rest of the government's waking up. This threat's in our face. And so we have to do that well. And that's when you see, as I've heard my Australian friend tell me one time, that the, the sleeping giant wakes up. And the biggest problem is how to shut it down once they wake up. But, uh, uh, but the point is, is there's some real truth in that. I think you need to understand that. So that was my opening part. What I wanted you to understand is how we're connected together and why I got involved. And I think it's become a good blend of how we do business within the Pentagon today. Slide. I want to give you a magnitude of how big we are within DOD. And we're a very mobile force. The Secretary of Defense came out yesterday. He wants less garrison, more force. That talks to how I have to approach how we're going to deliver the information to the folks that are out there and the kind of tools that they're going to need for command and control decisions. You see up there that we're in 163 countries right now. You see six thousand separate locations and there's 3.7 million people all with different capabilities that are that are needed throughout the world if you take a look at that it seems like a simple operation they're firing on uh, on taliban forces out there that's not a simple operation folks that connects it all and it just seems like a benign picture if you start to see what's happening in that particular picture where i've got a rover which is what, what you would kind of call basically a tablet they're getting information from ISR, which is your intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance from satellites, from UAVs, from other airplanes. If they're in trouble, they're going to get they're going to get support, fire support, either from an artillery that's going to actually be directed in by those particular folks, or a guy that's in a forward location, or we're going to bring in a, a fast back in, in this case, which is something of an F-16 coming in at 500 knots, carrying 500 pound bombs. If they get themselves in trouble, all that's coordinated, all that's connected, and all that's built around the fact that we have to be able to get the bad guy, we have to protect the good guys, and we can't hurt anybody else. That is really tough, that last part. That last part is really tough, to try to blend out bad guys, good guys, and make sure that in a counterinsurgency operation, we minimize casualties. That takes a level of technology that I'm not sure people fully understand when they watch it on TV every day. And delivering that technology at the right time, at the right place, accurately and protected, is the business that we have to do. And so I think that takes a relationship with all of the partners that are out there, all the subs, all the major contractors, et cetera. And I'll talk to them a little bit more slide. You see we're all over the world. Keep in mind, we are positioned in places that, that you would find shocking as the little countries, little places, all over the place. And you can see right there at the top, we've got a simple helicopter that's going out there that we may be creating a counterinsurgency operation you just saw in the first one. Or the next day, it's going to be off the coast of a country because they just had a tsunami and we've got to save lives fast. And I've got to connect to their networks right now and I have to take risk and security and I've got to get that data fast and I have to protect the backbone of what we have in case there's something wrong in that particular network. Because I've got to deliver food now and water because I've got anywhere from 12 to 24 hours before people die. And so that's the kind of networks and the kind of delivery that I have to do. On the bottom, you see off the of Avian a little they call it a growler. It's basically uh, an electronic warfare type aircraft, if you will, and its job is to protect Americans and to kick the door down. In some cases, not a counterinsurgency operation, but we have to go in and kick the door down. Now, that's a really different spin on, on cybersecurity right there. Now you're talking about electronic warfare. You're talking about the electromagnetic uh, spectrum and the spaces within there. That's another twist on it that I'm going to discuss a little bit today, so remember that particular picture. Slide. You see that we have to have partners all over the world. I talked about partners in a country that suddenly has a major disaster that only the U.S. government can help deliver the kind of supplies they need and the kind of speed they need to do before people start dying. You also start to see the federal agencies, the state and local, industry partners, and academia. We're big in academia. Uh, there was a design out there, if you're familiar with the term FFRDC, and basically what it is, is that DOD was always designed to connect to academia because we want to have an independent look at what we're doing. 
We want to know where we're being stupid, if we're being stupid, and how we can do things better. So we connect very much into the academic world. I will tell you this, when you start connecting networks to an academia world, there's a lot of potential for risk there. And you have to understand that right off the bat, so you have to know what you're doing. We start to walk up with the industry partners. Industry partners have very level of cyber. Okay. I can tell you right now, I work with two major uh, defense contractors in the past couple of weeks on the mobile security stuff that we were talking about how they did business. I was surprised. Okay, I was surprised. I walked away knowing that we're leading, we're leading the fight with the capabilities and how we do business in the mobility side, and that they could learn a lot from us, which I can't say in some areas, I'll be honest. So but I can't say that. This, this, this issue is in our face, and we're getting very good at it very fast. <laughs> slide. What am I worried about? I'm going to spend a minute on this slide because I think it's really all about the whole discussion today. I might actually use this, the world's largest laser pointer that I was getting here today. I think, for love of God. Anyways, somebody can fix this and make it smaller, please. Anyway, anyway, speed of change. It's incredible the speed of change that you have right now and what is happening out there in the world and how this equipment that we had for one purpose is being used for another. You have to keep up with it. You have to understand what's happening out there. Now, I'll give an example. We weren't sure exactly how we want to do secure mobile devices and how we were going to do that for the forces out there. But you can see that's one of my, uh, the third one on that particular list. So what I did to try to understand this was I gave one to my 11-year-old, to a Samsung Galaxy Portal, one to my 15-year-old, and one to my 29-year-old. And I watched them, how they used it. And it was fascinating because each one of them used it differently. And so because of that, I realized, hmm, I just got to build an infrastructure that allows us to jump the productivity. And before I even finish that, the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Dempsey, who's even older than me, because we look at different generations uh, on this particular piece, went out to the academies and go, we're going to provide this capability to you. You tell us how to use it. Because we don't know where we're going to go. We know how we want to use it today. We've got definite lanes, et cetera. We don't know where it's going to end. And that's the point that we have to make sure when we're thinking about cybersecurity in there and information assurance as to where is this going to go. You're not going to know every place. But you can start to think through those things by actually talking to folks and seeing how they use those devices. That is the speed of change that I'm talking about. And if we don't keep that, I will tell you that our nation will not stay ahead as far as its ability to produce the most innovative products in the world. And from the other side of the ballpark, your military will not be, become, or will not stay, I should say, as the premier force in the world. I think that's very important for us to understand. The ideas that come out of the United States are phenomenal. I see them all over the world. I have lived almost everywhere. I can honestly say I've always been in every country. And, and the culture that we have is an innovative culture. We need to keep that. And that speed of change is a very good thing. We have to make sure that we're allowing that to occur. And I'm going to talk about that spectrum here again. Electromagnetic spectrum. So we've just come off of a big discussion. Uh, the telecom industry, which uh, you're filled with CTIA and Steve Sharp and those guys, we know them very well out there. And they want the spectrum that the federal government holds, and in particular, where DOD holds spectrum. And the reason is simple. We own beachfront property that helps the telecom industries to actually be able to have more spectrum so you get more bandwidth so that you can move faster in 4G, LTE, etc. So we actually have a pretty good relationship with them. It was, it was kind of a, a very combative piece to it, but we made an agreement to figure out how to give them what they needed and to give us what we needed and to work towards the future in these auctions, if you will, towards a, a partnership, which I'm going to talk to again, that actually gets us better efficiency, better agility, and better spectrum management. And I think that's going forward very well. It's a lot of work because there's an auction coming up. If you give you the kind of money that we're talking about here, I'm estimating anywhere from 11 to 15 billion dollars will come out of this particular auction. So this is not, this is more expensive than any amount of gold that you can imagine. It gets more and more expensive as it goes because they want that beachfront property. And so bottom line to it is we are going to squeeze DOD into a smaller space in one particular area. We're going to go into another space. And at the same time, we're going to allow telecoms to share some particular area there to keep innovation in the United States and move forward. The strength of our nation, it's for our economy, and I think we've got a good marriage between those two. But if you think about it from another, spe uh, another uh, uh, perspective, we have any automotive folks in this particular area here, ministry. One of their problems is they want to make the car connect to the internet, if you will, and to different places, any place that hits a Wi Fi hotspot. They need spectrum for that. So they're struggling on the spectrum side too. So that's another piece of the puzzle that they're working with hand in hand. So we're seeing this all over, and we're trying to make sure that we have this correctly, and we also have to match the rest of the world. Because if you understand LTE, in certain bands, LTE, 4G as you know it, can interfere with 
the cross links between satellites, so we can't have it in that particular bank. So we have to watch where it goes in those parts of the world. It's a very complex piece of the puzzle. You know. All the side electromagnetic spectrum, as I jump around, is that growl that you saw in the beginning, that airplane. That's the electronic warfare piece. Well, guess what? Enemies build their particular uh, uh, weapon systems in all sorts of spectrum. So it can be it can be spectrum that, that's right in the middle of telecom machines, and I have to design systems that go against those right in the middle of something that maybe for health, welfare, and fire in our country and other countries. So we have to figure out how we practice with those, how we design those, and how we do the right things at the right time to prevent hurting good people when we're trying to make sure that we have the capability if somebody comes against us in the rush. Cybersecurity. I'm going to talk right back to where we began. We talked about IA, and it's one of the uh, things that I've kind of discussed the most in my own particular realm, is we in DOD and a lot of other places have bolted on IA's and Afterthought. Those are those people that, that, that were kind of left in the back there, and they came in and they'd say, yes, information assurance is fine, cybersecurity is fine. No. That's caused a lot of our problems that we have today. We've learned rapidly that we need to bring them in early on for the design, and that needs to be burned in the beginning. Okay? I can give you example after example if that's true. And thinking about where something moves and speed chains from where we were in the past and where we move in the future ties together the SCADA. So if you think about where SCADAs are today, where they were, okay, they, they were all designed to be what I would call a closed network, not connected to the internet, and they all had different protocols. That was one of the protections. They had different protocols that prevented anybody to have, they couldn't hack them all because every different company had them differently. Today, the protocols have been standardized. Why? Because we're connected to the internet. So those systems that were closed systems of yesteryear are today uh, open systems that can be accessed from any place in the world. And we didn't think through that correctly. We didn't burn in the IA in the beginning. And it's a risk. It's a threat. It exists. So from a company's perspective, in some aspects, they're like, well, if I put a lot, of, uh, put a lot of protection on that, that access is going to be more difficult to get to that. I'm not going to make it. User experience is not going to be good. Danger is you can have catastrophic failure if you're not careful. But I believe you can actually burn in a good user experience as well as the security if you do it up front. And that would be a message I'd give you right now. So you've got to think ahead. Right? And I think basically the product life will also last longer. Your product life is going to last longer in that particular aspect. And that's going to be a profit margin that will continue on down the line if it's done correctly. So we have to think through this. I think there's a lot of other examples that we can think through on cybersecurity. And I'm going to draw this on a partnership later. But I think some, some of you folks are familiar with the defense industrial uh, group that they have out there that we work hand in hand with the uh, clear defense contractors. We have 100 of them now approximately in there. And we work hand in hand on cybersecurity issues. But we've also just made that permanent now. So that's going to be a permanent part of government. And that's taken over a year of heavy comments. So one year of comments going back and forth. Is this the right way to go from the government perspective? Is this how we, how we move forward and have this intellectual dialogue of how we and government share what we know and what we think we need to connect to industry with. And that's where this defense industrial group comes in, and that's their first hungry companies. They've also moved even farther, and that's the enhanced cybersecurity and information awareness group that they have connected to that for those that want to join them. And those particular groups will actually pay into the government because it's going to take a lot of contractors on our side and a lot of government folks to work that we give them insights and even deeper as to what the issues are that we're seeing out there in the world. And the idea of that is, is to make sure that we have a set of environment out there of standards and protocols that protect everybody to allow everybody to have freedom of movement within the cyberspace regime. Mobility. Mobility is a huge piece. What is mobility, first off? Okay, so DOD's got lots of computers. If you see my desk in my office, you'd be shocked. I've got all these different screens and computers. It's just too expensive. We don't need to go down that particular road. How do we do the various methods of, of getting good mobility, connecting to industry, if you will, and finding out where we can use commercial off-the-shelf products? In the past, we have only used blackberries. You always see a lot of DOD with blackberries. That that was the standard product at that particular time. Today, we have options, but we need diversity in our products. So we're moving out. We'll be opening up in December a new mobile device management that's going to replace how we do business within DoD. That mobile device management will also have a mobile app store connected to it. So yes, DoD is going to apps, and so we'll have a big thing of apps as well as the MDM. And I've been working this through. It's a fully paid program within DoD, and we have approximately 600,000 devices. So I will have devices on the unclassified realm, as you remember the old BlackBerry days. I will have classified devices all the way to top levels of classification. 
all on commercial devices with the proper NSA encryption tools built into it. So I will use, I will use an Android product, I will use a, an Apple product, and I will use tablets, and I will use phones, and also have a, uh, a Windows product, as well as BlackBerry for that diversity in product lines. We don't look at necessarily the actual security in the phone per se, although that's a piece of it, but we also look at it on the network as well. We combine the network piece with the phone, and that's the security that we have. So we will work the actual gateways that come in and we'll be able to control those phones from that particular perspective, but it's not just a phone. It's a phone from all the people that are the, the digital immigrants, and that's what I am in this particular room. For everybody else, it's data. It's all about the data coming in. It's about how it's being used. It's used from, from moving information back and forth. It's, move, it's, it's for making decisions. It's also for command and control, whether that's actually actuating a product or actually giving a decision to someone. So all those tools that are on my desk potentially could be paid for by a single uh, tablet in the future. So that's some of the discussions that we're having right now because you can imagine the massive savings you could do and the jump in productivity here. I had three goals that went forward with this. I wanted to make it as cyber secure as it was today or better with a burn in of even further, and we've done that. I wanted to make it cheaper, and I wanted to have to jump the productivity curve. We'll see how far we jump the productivity curve. We're already seeing it. We're saving $90 million estimated first year. So that's what we're taking a look at. Now, some people have asked us about BYOD. So that's bring your own device. For all that don't know, not bring your own beer. That's the one I remember very well. Uh, but uh, bring your own device is where many companies have gone, well, I don't want to carry two devices. I just want to have, I just want to have that one single device. We have not gone down that road. Federal government in some cases are. We have cybersecurity issues within DOD that we think are a little bit greater. And we also don't think, and it's critical here, that it's going to save us that much money in the end game. Because while you have a bunch of products out there, who generates when they're updated? Who generates to the young, to the young Marine to tell him to go update his cybersecurity? And if something goes wrong and I gotta wipe it, I'm gonna wipe every picture he's ever had of his children. All these different issues that are out there. But more importantly, if I'm gonna replace everything on that desk, on that desktop that we talked about there, with a tablet from the system, I have to go much deeper than just go into a web mail. That's not where we're at. I want to get to the files, to get to my stuff, to be able to work mobile. That's very different than a BYOD solution. That's the real savings. That's the real savings and the real productivity savings. Versus just a simple, I want my email, uh, and I want to be able to get it uh, and use my own personal phone. So that's the difference of how we're looking at from the different ways that we're seeing. And we'll see how we go. We think there might be technology in the 2016-ish uh, time frame that will allow us to potentially do a BYOD or at least have a, a split system within it. But that's not something on the shelf today that I can go buy cheaply, put them out quickly, and get them out to the market. So what we've done, this is a key point that I'm trying to drive at, we spark. So we built a bunch of pilots up front to see what is it is the doable right now in a mass move, and what is the kind of stuff we want to spark with in the future. So we did a bunch of pilots. We took the best of the best. We built it into an RFP, sent it out to industry, said we want help in this area. So they came back, we put contracts out on it, and now we're moving forward and we're spiraling at the same time to find different ways to do this to keep increasing our capability and to keep moving forward. I don't know if any of you guys are used to the, the ID cards that we have in our little CAC sleds, we call them, in that sled. Sleds more than the damn uh, phone, so excuse the terminology here. So the bottom line is we've got to find a different way to do that. It's not the way uh, to go forward. So that's what the spirals are looking at. It's called ID. That's the identification of who the individuals using the phone. And so that's, we have about five different uh, uh, actual pilots, four with another one that we're about to bring out, and we're looking at all those methods to make it cheaper and more secure. So what I'm trying to drive at here with a little bit of a diatribe is the point that when you bring out a product, you already got to start looking as to how you're improving that product from all different methods. And so moving the security aspects forward, moving the productivity forward, and moving the cybersecurity forward. So I just would like to add that, and that's something that I'm not sure we did very well in the past, but that ties back to the speed of change. And so all that connects, and that's what you're seeing DOD do very quickly, enterprise solutions. Okay, we design all of our networks within DOD in a kind of enclave methodology. And then enclave methodology was basically, you just built a network that you needed, because that's how you do business, you can't do that. It's too expensive, okay? It's too expensive, it's got too much service area for attack, it's, it's, it's uncontrolled per se, and we're not gonna, you know, we're gonna collapse those networks, and we're gonna come with an enterprise solution. Now there's some redundancy that you have to balance the risk list. At the same time, the number of networks we have is a big risk and it's also too costly. One of the good parts of, of the fact that we brought a sequestration is that we've got to deeply look at, at 
how we do business to find better ways to do business. But I will tell you, it's hard to get people to release what they've done all their lives to find a better way. That is tough. That goes to the soul. Okay? And it's a very ugly year when it comes to fighting all those particular areas. And you gotta get it right. And you can't let little little sections of it stay back there because if you have an enclave that's still connected out there, what does it do? It risks the whole network. So you have to be careful of that and you have to understand that particular respect. So we're doing that quickly. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that, I promise. So I'll, I'll get some depth in that and be able to see some pictures. Slide. Goal of the DOD CIO. I'm going to stop though first. I'm going to say, where does the CIO sit? Because we just had a big discussion on how we're organized from a DOD perspective. Because we're trying to cut folks, if you will, we're trying to do 20% cuts across the board. We're coming back from a fight. It's a very, it's a very tumultuous time within the military. We're coming back from a fight. We're trying to re-figure out where we're going to be in the future with a much, much smaller budget, folks. And so we've got to do this right. So what is the role of the CIO in today's world? And that is where and where does it fit? So does a CIO work for a CFO? Hell, I don't look up what a CFO was once. And so, and so, so the chief financial officer, or does it work for the CEO directly, or does it work for the chief technology officer? That kind of depends on the company. We went out across industry to Apple, to all the different companies, toy companies, that was actually pretty interesting. And then and all the different places. By the way, we're probably the most innovative, in touch with what's going on is a little toy company that's great. Uh, but uh, so we went across the board, took a look, and what we found was that if you're going to stay ahead of this issue and burn in with cybersecurity and IA up front, that person's got to be able to talk to the CEO and he's got to be respected directly in there. Who's the CEO in our world? Secretary of Defense. So that's the point that we're trying to make sure that we have. Now, CIO within DOD is a little bit different because we own an awful lot of stuff. And we own a lot of command and control, we own a lot of pieces, but it's critical. So that's the part that I would drive home, is even before you get to the, uh, where you are in your particular company, whether it's small or large, you've got to figure who reports to who to make sure that that particular direction as to where the company's going is a clear cut. So I'll leave that there. It's also a personality piece. There is a personality aspect to this, but you've got to have the right leaders in the right place. You can organize the best you can, but if you've got crappy leaders, it's irrelevant. So you have to have the right folks that are willing to go forward and have that push and move forward. All right, so that's the role of the CIO perspective. I'll talk to each one of these here. The first one we're going to go right off the bat is that we ensure the Department of Defense Network. So that talks about that collapsing network that we talked about as well to make sure that we have the right number of networks to support the mission, not too many, at the same time balance it with the cybersecurity needs and the productivity of those 3.7 million people working with their international partners. I can't stress this enough. We have to connect to we have to connect to them all the time, yet we have to be careful of the cyber risk and we have to minimize it. There's no way to mitigate the risk completely, but we can protect the most critical aspects as to how we do these particular networks, and we have to do it quickly. I can tell you, in a tsunami, in a, in a, in a type of scenario as we did, we have to do some things very fast to connect ISR assets, whether it's space-based, air-based, non-air breathing, meaning uh, uh, unmanned versus manned being, to find out, for example, what's going on with nuclear power plants, to make sure that we can give that to the country, to make sure that we can take care of things as an example of that, to be able to deliver goods to starving folks on some remote location fast, and you don't have many times to do that, or within our own nation here, as we connect to local, uh, the local networks and that, when we have a big issue that happens in the country, and only DOD can go in. So in other words, when they were worried about what was happening on the East Coast, when they, had, when they had that the hurricane-like storm. I can't tell you how many uh, actual trucks that do power line stuff were flown by DOD airplanes across the country to land on the East Coast to make sure that they were ready to go. Or if you're talking about California fires, as to where the fires are, how do we find the hot spots, how do we help do that, how do we get those assets out there. Those are the kind of networks we rapidly have to build and get and fit. And one of the rooms at DISA, which is our defense information service agent here, you'll see a room of boards almost like this that actually has a whole network thing. It looks like a giant fight, if you will, and you can see all the different things going on in the networks and what's under attack, etc. And that happens every day, by the way. Uh, so we we'll talk here of working with the Defense Industrial Basic Secure Information File to, to National Defense. This is growing rapidly. And I'm finding, I'm surprised to say this in some aspects, that DOD is very much becoming a great leader as far as understanding the cybersecurity threat out there and how to information 
an information security perspective, how to actually protect data best, and we're trying to lean forward to take the industry information to provide what we have so we get better at this, so that we have freedom of action within the cybersecurity environment. So I, I throw that one out there because I think that's something we're going to see grow, and it's becoming a permanent program as of this November uh, of 2013, and I think you need to keep in mind to watch that as it grows in the future, though, because I think it will be a part of, part of where we are. We're in an intellectual dialogue with our own government. What and where does government belong with holding industry forward to protect their own intellectual property? So one of those that I did not talk about in the beginning there is as I went through those, those four different things that I worry about, there's another one. And that last one is why I want to talk about it right here, and that's culture. I didn't put it on there for a lot of reasons, but culture is also a part of the information assurance and cybersecurity. Depending upon where you are in the world, that means different things. Intellectual property rights in certain countries, and certain countries that are in this room, are very different than they are in the United States. And that needs to be understood right up front, and that means different things from a different perspective as to what is criminal and what is not criminal that we look at. Where does the internet belong? If, and I work on the internet stuff and we go over seas and that from different countries, they have a very different, they have a very different view. They look at it as a threat. They look at it as a giant threat to that because their society does not have the same level of open information in there. So we in the U.S. inherently are always going to have uh, some cyber weakness in the perspective because we have a very open government. That's who we are. And where, it, where this belongs in the future is a great intellectual dialogue right now. But we have to understand when we're working across the world that some look at the internet as a threat, we look at it as a methodology to move commodities for many people in this particular room right here, and they work as a, as a way to move stuff quickly. That's not the same everywhere else. And within countries, you have different views in their government, and you also have a criminal element out there that does things very differently. So that's another piece of the puzzle. It's not always bad countries, not like it. It's a lot of times criminal elements. And so, and the criminal elements in some cases can work for the government in some cases, or they can give their product to the government for payment. That's another problem that you see out there as well. So all of that is where we see that connection to industry to move forward and find out what the right way is from a global environment to have that set of protocols, to have that set of standards, to have that set of agreed upon correct way to act in this particular environment is a way to think about it. There's a couple of models out there right now this is the part that our, our lawyers go on for hours. Give a Westphalian model, which means any time a piece of data goes through some server for another country, that that's their server for that particular country, and you can never go after that data, even if it's a malware going after you, without their approval and, and, and go into that country first. Well, you can't do that in site. Or it's the global commons model, like you see in space, where it's all considered, when it's in a, a man-made domain, like cyber, that any place in the world it is just globally for the world. That's the two different models. Most lawyers will always sit on the traditional Westphalian model. They will. So that's that's the other side of the ballpark you need to understand. So when you tie culture and legal together, you now have a real problem depending on where you are. Okay? And that connects to cybersecurity and information assurance and how you do business every single day. So it's just the difference between a world and the world's become extraordinarily smaller by virtue of what we provide to the internet side to. And everybody in the world where I go to that the internet is purely American, it's an American piece out there. So that's the other sometimes belief out there. I don't know. You can you can figure out who, who designed it, which which ex vice president or dark or whatever else. But I'll do that on the slide. <laughs> you need cyber security goals. We are there, and I'll tell you how we're going to do these to assure mission execution in the face of cyber warfare by the most capable adversary every single day. That's our job. Better, safer sharing of all DoD mission partners. Freedom of action in cyberspace for our mission commanders. And I want to make sure he doesn't consider this just about war fighting. In many cases, this is about taking care of all sorts of missions throughout the world. And in many cases, it's about saving lives and making a difference when the world comes apart by virtue of a tsunami, a hurricane, other natural disasters that occur. And the ability to deliver trusted information to sure network and network <coughs> across the department. So how are we doing this? Slide. And I'll talk to each one of these. So one of the ways we talk about collapsing those networks is the joint information environment. This is a big piece that we have. This is not a program of record. It's a giant DOD program that's billions and billions of dollars. Not at all. It's about making sure that we have a set of standards and the protocols, everything built. So anything we hang on those standards and protocols meets the future requirements and is a standardized system. I will call it one network. Okay? And that makes a lot of cases for your own countries or your own uh, uh, companies as you get as you get larger is 
that we actually are now finding ourselves bringing up the risk assessment to a higher level. In other words, at the lower levels, some of the areas where they were allowed to make decisions have to be brought up because it's one network and it affects the whole one. This is the joint information environment. It's probably the biggest change in DOD that not everybody fully understands right now that's going on. And this will affect us for probably the next 20 years if we get this right. And it's something that we're working uh, every single day. We have a team working this and how we're going to go forward. We've already started implementing it in Europe, and we'll do this throughout the globe and connect up this correctly in the right way. So I'm going to talk a little more about this slide. So how are we going to realign, restructure, and modernize how we do business? And it's not there, but make it cheaper. To, it's too damn expensive, okay, the way we've been doing it in the past. And that's the JIA. And to be honest, it's money that actually drove us faster in this particular region. So it was the money piece that got us to where we got and got us to say this is in our face, we have to get there. But in the meantime, while we were doing it, we realized we could deliver more security, more capabilities, and do it better and cheaper if we went down this particular route. Okay, this is a big deal. This seems like, okay, we have to write a bunch of technical manuals and operational standards and policies. That is a big deal. This is an intellectual dialogue that, that is occurring throughout the U.S. government. Where is it that the level of cybersecurity and our policies belong? When is it that you can actually go after something that's attacking you, and when do you have to defend yourself? Okay, so those are the kind of questions that you have to ask. I'll give you some examples. So do you have to wait until you're under attack before you actually protect this? Or are you like a ship at sea, if you will, where if somebody attacks your ship, you can actually protect yourself even though you're outside your own country. But that doesn't give you the next right to go after where that attacking force came from. So those are the three levels that we're talking about. And that matters as to how well you can protect yourself. So we're not talking about offense here. We're talking purely about how to defend yourself and defend your networks. Clarifying the operational roles and responsibilities. Where does DOD's role end? Where does the other inter agencies end? How do we work this together? Because it just can't have this abrupt ending in one area, and the Department of Homeland Security has another, and the State Department has another, and all, you can't do that. It's just a cluster at that particular point, and you have basically another set of vulnerabilities to put forward. So we're trying to move forward on that within DOD and the inter agency to get this right. And then improving cyber information sharing within the department, and I think there's a missing piece to this, and that's with industry. And that's a huge piece of it. with industry. Try to set those standards, learn from you, and us learn, and you can learn from us, and together we'll build forward on the right way to go forward. Because it's about an environment in the world that has to use these tools for the future. And you just have to be ready so that no one can take advantage of it. That's really your deterrence. Okay? If you're well protected, nobody's gonna screw with you. Okay, and that's the bottom line to it. So if you think about it that way, it actually prevents people from taking advantage of it. Slide. Rethinking our strategy that DOD has the expert capable information technology and cyber workforce. Our cyber workforce is being revamped at a rapid rate. We are doing massive change in this particular area to train them. We are not as good with the DOD as we think we need to be, and we need to train those folks right. How do I take a youngster that's coming in uh, to, in today's world and train him to be a basically not just someone we used to call cable dogs that runs cable into the walls, if you will, and put that network up, but to be a true cyber warrior, per se, of a defensive nature, or offensive nature, or whatever is needed out there, but to understand this stuff to that particular level and to be innovative. That's the part that we're working on right now, and I think we're, we're moving forward. It takes a while to get us to the right place, but we're talking about some significant training and amount of investment that we're going to have to do with each one of our individuals and how do we do it best. We've, all, we've gone through all sorts of out-of-box solutions. Active duty folks, how we train them. Do we have reserve and guard units that are near? I don't know if you name it. Name the company that has the expertise out there. And that they can provide that particular capability and their expertise. So we can provide them expertise for their training that we can do with them within DOD. And they can provide their expertise from industry back to us. And that's a methodology of doing it. That's a relationship. And that's where we talk about building those relationships. That is a way to do business in the reserve and the guard. So I think that's also back to our nation's heritage, the Minuteman, if you will. I think that all connects together. That is a method, but we also need a group that is just not active duty that spends 10, 20 years in a particular field and moves forward. They also have to be leaders in these fields. So this has been probably a three month, several tank sessions within the, within the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff to find out the best way to take care of America's youth and growth forward. Writing down a I mean, DOD cyber space. It's got to be a DOD cyber strategy that works for every other department. It's just massive. So you think of things, I'll do that in two weeks. I'm thinking years. 
by the time you get this right. And the first one won't be right. And you'll have to revise it again, and it'll get down to the next one. And it'll grow with the changes that happen out there in the world. Doing all this with a wide range of interagency and international partners. I actually think sometimes that working with industry and international partners is much easier than working with the interagency. Uh, so but that's a personal opinion. Please don't go with that. Uh, I just asked that for the help. But the point of the matter is, those are three very different entities right off the bat. Um, and and it, 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 it's actually very fascinating to work with international partners. I really enjoy doing that. Because I work with people in other countries out there and where they're going and, and, and how they do things. Really gives me an insight how to do business better. And actually, I learned a lot from hearing and listening to that. Uh, industry, the same way. Not as much an in interagency, but I'll just leave it at that. That was a joke. <laughs> Slide. We are designed for real estate markets. We are on the move everywhere in the world. We have to be on the move. We are less and less of a garrison force, and we're going forward throughout different countries of the world and working with the local folks in that and building networks on the fly in many cases. They all have to be protected. And that's the part that I want to drive here, is everything here is connected to everything else. We and our, and our partners use IT for everything. Don't take that word. IT means something different for every single person out of this particular world. Do not forget that. And potential <coughs> adversaries understand this. And I would argue potential adversaries understand it better than we do. Okay? They understand that this could be a weakness in us because who we are as Americans is an open society. We trust people in most cases more than a lot of other cultures do because that's who we are. That makes us, that makes us in my opinion, who we are and a good thing, but it's also how other countries take advantage of it. Never forget that, okay? So it is what it is, and I think that's an important point to drive home, and I am open for questions. It's a Someone who just has an axe to grind 
or someone who wants to do something of a nature that can have some catastrophic impact, whether regional or nationwide, or some other place in the world. So I think that we need to understand that. I don't want to, you know, I get from people sometimes that, well, you're going to have to have a major catastrophe before you actually do something about it. I don't think that's, that's true. That's really why I'm here. I really want to send a message that I think this can be done before that happens. And, you know, my glass is half full. I am not a glass half empty guy. Okay. So, and the other side to it is, if they try to do it and they fail, or if they do it and they have some success, but you're able to immediately brunt that attack, you actually won the battle right there because no one's going to want to do it again because they didn't have it. It actually, it actually puts their organization that tried to do it looks makes them look stupid, and, and they lose a lot of their recruiting ability. Because never forget, if it's a if it's a group like I'm talking about now. A catastrophic impact that can be on the press, because that's what they're looking for, is a recruiting tool for them. If you stop that, then in fact, you've actually wanted the next attack. Okay? So that's why I think it's important. And I honestly believe, done correctly with the right engineering, it is not an expensive piece of the puzzle. So I throw that out. Okay? Um, but, but it's in your face, it's there right now, and there's bunches of sites that you can look at that have been documented. I, was, I thought about this last night about the state attacks. I think you can see all the way from the first one I read last night uh, from 1992, all the way up that are documented ones that are in open press right now of all the different scan attacks. That's a prime example of where they were closed network systems before, now they're open networks, and they use the fact that they have a standardized protocol and they after those particular systems. I think that's, that's where you're going right now. Please. Another question. General, um, DOD is the single largest owner of critical infrastructure in the United States. You think so? Yeah, I know so. Well, okay, well, the, the electric power grid? No. Um, well, see, the electric power grid is owned by a whole bunch of different people. Oh, I see. I look at my That's good. Okay, so you, I see your, I see your, you know, sure. As a um, single owner of your product, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and much larger than any other single owner. Okay, I'll agree with you on that. I don't know. There's a, there's a dichotomy between the traditional IT uh, triad of CIA, confidentiality, integrity, sure. uh, availability, and the critical infrastructure triad of availability, integrity, and confidentiality. How does DOD deal with that dichotomy? Well, it's, it's one that we're talking So basically what you're talking about from an information assurance perspective is protecting private data. Is that what I'm getting? No. What I'm talking about is um, you know, the, uh, in critical infrastructure, Availability is more important than confidentiality. Keeping the keeping the plan running. Right. Uh, keeping well, for example, um, in DOD's case, um, keeping your steam plant running uh, on the base is, is more important than losing data out of the uh, out of the the thing. Because if it dies, then you don't have steam, and you can't, for example, the Navy can't run a catapult. Um, sure. And, and things like that. That's, that's the, the, the difference in thrust between um, the traditional IT look at things where data confidentiality is the most important thing by far and critical infrastructure where a continued availability of resources is the most important thing by far. Okay, I think so. Okay, so, so here, here's how I would look at that. I, the first part I would, I would tell you is I think that picture is changing. The traditional versus where we're going in the future. I think that's happening. I don't think it's happening overnight, but I think that's occurring right now. And I would argue that the traditional side um, is going to be the one that's going they're going to go after from from a cyber perspective, and that's how you that's how you end up getting some attention. So if you want to try to make that change as to how people think about this, you can show through cyber how the actual steam, if you will, or whatever it is that they use every single day, can be affected if they don't understand this right off the bat. And so that, that's the approach I'd use for it um, and, and go from it from the perspective of that catapult requires all sorts of IA and cyber type connections at this particular time on, on a ship that if we don't get that right and burn it in right up front, it can be used against us on that particular arena. So that's it. And the availability piece, you know, I would argue right off the bat, you have the potential every single day to lose availability of a product if you don't do this right. So, so when I'm in there talking to a CEO, if you will, or in this case, Secretary of Defense, we've got to make a decision, okay? Availability is based upon the cybersecurity piece. So we have to decide how much money we're willing to spend to make sure we have availability every day to protect these particular systems. Those are all connected directly together. Did that answer it? Okay, okay, good, okay.
Good day, sir. Good day. Um, from, the, from the early 80s to the mid 90s, I worked for the U.S. Navy for 14 years. Good. And um, your number one constraint for your plan is trustworthy talent. And and so. So you're inside of the record saying? No, you need you, you need people who understand cyber security and computer system architecture. Great. Right. That are Americans or trustworthy internationals. Great. And uh, and so I was put through school on a co-op from the U.S. Navy. All right, through my master's degree. And those types of programs are this big compared to where they were in the 80s. Sure. And contractors, for the most part, do not want to train up people. They'll go overseas to get that talent. Mm -hmm. So to me, that is a security threat. Okay. That you need to have, that you, you have to reinstate um, training within the United States and its allies to bring up, to bring up that pool that's necessary to enable your vision. So how do you, uh, do you, is that part of your plan? That's when I talk to the, uh, when we talk to the actual training that goes on in the cyber workforce, yes, we agree with you. So we, what we did is a lot of the training you talked about there, uh, that, that was done there, kind of got switched more to tuition assistance. Tuition assistance was something that most of the services paid for completely. They got to, I, I, I'll, I'll come back to you here. And so they took the money out of the training that you had, and they put it in something else. We're going backwards now. And we're actually starting to go forward, and I'll, I'll hit you again here real quick, is to take the focus that we used to have, like you're addressing there, and that was part of the tank session, talking about how do we train the workforce in the future within the DOD to produce the kind of people that we need that can do the job that you're talking about right here. And that was a that was a very introspective look that we're not doing it to the level that we want to do it. How do we do it better? Because first off, the world's changed dramatically, as you would agree. And so where do we go? Go ahead, follow on, please. I used the wrong word. Okay. It's not just training. When I co-op, I had military personnel that I worked with who'd been in the military around coordinates for their whole lives. Right. Right. And that mentoring is is really what gives you knowledge. Sure. Great. And, and so the ha um, that piece is missing in today's idea of training the workforce. It's actually the mentoring of young people able to make, you know, or not afraid to make a decision. Okay, so, agreed. In, your, in that field, I would say yes. So what we have actually done is, is, is in that cyber workforce, uh, when we built this, we built a, a plan to how we grow these folks. That doesn't mean just train them up front. That means grow them into these leaders. That was a discussion I had. So leadership as a piece of the mentoring, it, already, it starts all the way in college on the STEM programs we're now waiting for. Because we don't have enough engineers. It starts there in many cases. We don't have enough engineers. So we're going back to the school saying, we want to change. When I was a pilot coming to the United States Air Force, you could not come to the United States Air Force to be a pilot in the year group I was unless you were an engineer first, okay? So you had to be an engineer first, then you could be a pilot. That starts there, and then there's the mentorship piece and the growing of it. But I look at my 15-year-old, I brought the story before, I have a 15-year-old that's at West Potomac High School. She is an engineer that used to work for Lockheed uh, that runs the school. She's a sophomore, and she's building engineering things with three-dimensional printers. She's building um, rockets. They're doing those kind of stuff. That starts there. But then when she gets into the military, you got to have that same level of mentorship each time to grow them into leaders. And what you're talking about is not risk-inverse decision-makers is what we're kind of getting to. Yes. I concur with that 100%. That's the exact discussion that, that was had, and they're building that particular plan for the future, okay? So, so you're not wrong, and I agree. I think we've got a way forward in that. I think it'll be bumpy along the road, but that's where we're going, okay? All right. Major General, I apologize, but we need to, we need to chop off the session. Okay. And, uh, but it, it's been a, a wonderful, inspiring, and exciting keynote. I thank you on behalf of, of everyone that's here this morning. I personally thank you for rescheduling that's fine. and getting you here today. We, we are really grateful to have you. I appreciate it. As a small token of our appreciation, we have the next generation laser pointer. <laughs> <laughs>